Thus far, we've examined the usefulness of two storage engines, one being the in-memory storage engine, the other being the CSV storage engine. There's a third useful storage engine that's provided by MySQL once the max package is installed. It's called the federated storage engine. So let's create a section in our notes and label it federated storage engine. This particular storage engine provides access to remote tables. And there's some notes, of course, regarding the usage of federated tables. However, just picture an example where within your enterprise environment, there is a server, a non-primary server, which has a table that you'd like to gain access to. There are quite a few ways you could approach gaining access to the table, including replicating the database that, consists, that contains a table, backing up and restoring the table, causing out of sync or out of synchrony, and so forth. But with federated access, you gain access to the live table structure on the remote system, providing you set things up properly. Now the example that we're going to use is the following. So the example is Linux CBT Media 1 contains a customer or customer's table that we want access to. And we're going to say that Linux CBT Media 1 contains the latest customers table. So we're going to define a table on the remote system and then set up federated access. Rather than replicating the table or backing it up and restoring it on a recurring basis, we'll simply link to it using MySQL's federated storage engine. So with federated tables, you define the table similarly to have how we've defined them using CSV as well as in memory tables but we include two additional options one being the type of storage engine and another being the connection string which points the local instance to the remote table so let's go ahead and make our connections work in a separate window let's ssh as root into linux cbt media one this is the remote db in the environment that we're labeling as the primary host of our customers table. So we're considering this server to be the authoritative source for this table information. We'll log in and once in of course we'll see what databases exist. Let's do a show databases. And we're going to go ahead and create a new database. Let's call it clients. Then we'll use clients and within clients we'll define a customer's table that will reference in a federated fashion. So again, just to recap our notes, we want remote access or federated access to a customer's table which will exist momentarily on this remote system. And of course we'll have to insert some bogus customers. So let's go ahead and create table. We'll call it customers and we'll define the customer's table to include an ID field which is of type integer and is to be auto incremented since we want unique customers within our table space. Let's also specify that it is the primary key, that's the ID column, followed by perhaps cust name, cust underscore name, and that should suffice. So cust underscore name will be of type var car 30. And we'll create this particular table and take a look at it. Let's show tables and let's describe customers and once we're happy we'll insert some data into it so let's go ahead and insert into customers and we'll simply define the column so we'll set cust underscore name or in fact let's just specify the column name so let's go ahead and specify customer name so we can indicate multiple customers so cust underscore name is the column followed by values and if we didn't specify column we would just go with values default that would work as well so values let's specify customer one as Linux genius and customer two as penguin 
rules. So we have two customers. Let's go ahead and double check our syntax. And we need to separate these parentheses here, which is why it's bombing on us. Super, now it's been inserted. Let's go ahead and select star from customers. So now we have two customers. One is called Linux Genius, the other one is called Penguin Rules. But again, rather than replicating this large amount of data across the wire to our client DB server, in this case, since in a federated fashion, one server acts as the client or one or more servers act as a client while one or more act as servers, we'll just configure a federated structure. In order to configure a federated table link, what you need to do is create a table on the client server which mimics the exact structure of the server table. The best way to do so is to execute a show create table against the name of the table that you'd like to treat in a federated fashion. In our case it's the customers table. Here's the syntax that we'll need and we'll make some changes. So let's take this copy it and paste it into our text file. So this is what we're going to execute with slight modifications on the client side or on Linux CBT DB1. We want to create a table called customers. Everything else looks fine but the engine instead is going to be called federated and of course we need to ensure that we have federated storage engine access on our system. The character set defaults to Latin 1 and there is another important item and that's the connection item that we need to specify. So let's go ahead and set that up. The connection is going to resemble a URI. So we'll make it equivalent to what you'll see momentarily which includes MySQL as the prefix followed by a syntax of user, optionally password, followed by the remote underscore host, optionally a port such as 3306, followed by the DB name and the table name. Seems like a lot but it isn't and it's actually quite logical and works similar to a typical URI for accessing FTP and HTTP base data. So let's go ahead and switch our access to include a username of Linux CBT and we'll need to be sure that this user has access a password of what should be XYZ123 but we'll confirm from a shell. Let's go ahead on the remote system we'll quit and attempt to connect as the user Linux CBT with a password of ABC or in this case XYZ123. If it lets us in we're good. If not we'll need to debug it should be something else. In fact it's ABC123 so we'll need to adjust our syntax to reflect ABC123. And again, this information will be stored in clear text, so only create federated links for non sensitive information, or if it is sensitive, protect access to the varlib MySQL database directory because the federated table will be created as a form file similar to the memory based tables within the database directory, which of course is beneath the default data directory. So the remote host in this case we can specify either as IP address or as a host name. If your ETC hosts file is properly configured just go ahead and specify the host name. In this case it's Linux CBT Media 1 followed by 3306 and the name of the database is called clients followed by the table name which is called customers. And that's it. We've completed the requirement for the connection string at least. So we're, we can now move forward with attempting to create this federated table and debug any potential errors that may surface. Now of course this entire line needs to be terminated with a semicolon so let's go ahead and terminate it and copy everything into memory and attempt to create access. Now before creating access on the local server Linux CBT DB1 ensure that the the database as well as the table exists over on the remote server or the server that will provide federated access. In this connection string we have username, password as well as the host name as well as port, database name as well as table name. All this needs to be set up. The user needs access, the password needs to be correct, the server name should be resolvable via DNS or via your hosts file or some lookup method the port needs to be correct. In some cases administrators alter the default port from 3306 to something else so confirm the port and confirm the name of the database as well as the name of the table.
If this has all been confirmed, including the structure and default character sets used on the target server or the host server for federated access, then go ahead and attempt to set up access on the local system or on n number of DB systems. Now this table will be created within our default database which happens to be HR. Let's execute show tables and you'll see that we currently don't have a table set up called customers. So it'll be created here. Let's go ahead and create it and it's been created. Let's re-execute a show tables and you'll see momentarily that we now have a federated link via the customers table. Now when we perform a select against the customers table, MySQL locally will proxy the connection to the remote system, Linux CBT Media 1, on our behalf. So let's go ahead and attempt to select star from customers and see how it works and debug if there are any problems. Notice the results were returned. Now, the results were returned very quickly because we're connected via high-speed connections between the two systems, local area network connections. Federated access will work in a wide area networking environment but isn't recommend, recommended, similar to clustering and also similar to replication setups. When using replication, clustering, as well as federated access, you should really use a highly high-speed connected interface between the two systems or high-speed interfaces between n number of systems. But there you can see we're able to select. Let's go ahead and on the target server update the data. We'll run an insert statement. So let's find the insert that we recently ran. And let's extend the Linux Genius customer to be Linux Genius LLC. And let's change Penguin rules to, let's say, simply Debian rocks. So now we have additional clients. So we need to use customers, or in this case, clients, and then rerun that query. And if we execute a select star from customers, you'll see that we now have two additional customers. So from the client server, if we rerun a query, you'll see that it's been reflected. MySQL is very powerful. It's very neat. And what you see here is just simply incredible. The fact that we're able to use a URI and simple TCP IP based connectivity to link or alias tables across the wire. So locally, we're able to interact with the data. Now you may be wondering, can we insert data from the local system or from the system that's providing the federated access? Let's go ahead and attempt to insert the same information with slight changes. So we'll take the same statement and just make a few changes. Let's call this Linux CBT, for example. And we'll place here that my SQL rocks. And notice that the insert statement ran locally across the federated connection. Let's confirm that the data exists locally and it does. And let's also cons confirm that this data exists remotely by rerunning a select and it does. So something we should note about federated connections is as follows. Note federated tables support only and this is for the time being. This is all again subject to change as is everything. Support only DML statements. And as you should know by now or well know by now, DML statements include select, insert, update, and delete, which are the common statements that you'll need to run anyway within a DBMS environment. But the simple fact that you can run any of these DML statements via a federated connection is pretty impressive. So we can insert, select, update, and delete the data across that federated connection. Now if you're interested in the syntax or you've forgotten the syntax and just want to recap what was used to define the connection, simply execute a show create table and the name of the federated table, which in this case happens to be customers. Also you should notice something else that's interesting. We have created a federated table or a linked table in a different database. We've used an, a database called HR to link the table customers. However, on the remote system, the database exists or the table exists in a database called clients. As you can see, a show or a select database that is will reveal that we're currently in the clients database. So you can link tables that are in different databases or different containers. Here's that create statement. And what's important in this create statement includes 
the engine type federated as well as a connection string. If the connection string is invalid in any way, you won't be granted access to the remote system or you won't have access to the federated data. So that's something else to keep in mind. And also, when you execute a show engines, as you know, it reveals the engines that are currently supported. You need to have federated access, which is provided via the MySQL Max package. And again, if the remote administrator changes anything about the system, including its name, it, the password for the user account that you're using, the user account name itself, or even the port, or the name of the DB, and the, the name of the table, then your federated connection or linked table will break. Otherwise, you should generally have no problems using federated tables. It works pretty smoothly. Now, you may be wondering, what if we were to go ahead and change Linux CBT's password on the remote system? We certainly could. We could set or use an update statement to update the user's password. Let's go ahead and set password for Linux CBT and we'll set it equivalent to what's between passwords so it gets hashed using the function, the password function. Let's set it to XYZ123. And since this is thrown in error, let's just find where we have our update password defined. We should have it defined somewhere in this document. We'll do a control F, look for password. And we'll just take our update statement and update it directly. Since the set bombed. Here's an update statement that we can copy and just alter it to suit our needs. So we're going to go ahead and update the password for the remote user in an attempt to break the federated connection. The remote user's name is actually Linux CBT. So let's set it where user equals Linux CBT. And let's confirm that the host is really any or is a wildcard. So we'll select user host password from mysql.user and the user's host is a wildcard so we don't need to specify the the host so we'll just skip the and section let's go ahead and execute this query updating the user's password to abc123 and now it's been changed now that it's been changed we'll quit the session and attempt to reconnect using abc123 and it should fail but we didn't flush tables, so let's go back in and execute a flush privileges. Not flush tables, but a flush privileges. And try to reconnect using ABC123, and it fails, but with XYZ123, it succeeds. So now that we know that it works, let's see if the federated connection still works. We'll show tables. The table still lists because it's defined locally but only when you attempt to retrieve data from it or perform a DML statement such as select, insert, update, delete will the connection break. So let's again attempt to select star from customers and you'll see what's here is actually cached. However, if we were to locally stop the MySQL instance, so let's backslash Q and then quit this particular instance, we'll SU in and execute an RSC MySQL restart. The table will be recreated and once we re-enter, we'll wait for it to shut and then restart. Let's return into MySQL. Let's use HR followed by a show tables and then select star from customers. So notice it breaks this time, which tells us that MySQL caches the connectivity. So the connection between the local system and the remote system is cached and based on existing credentials. But once we've broken the credentials by changing any portion of the credential setting, including username or password or host name or name of the database or table name, then the federated connection breaks. If we do a show create table customers you'll see the syntax that was used to create a table and let's go ahead and notice it throws an error because the connections broken but if we were to redefine the table using a different name then it would work we could try to drop table customers and you'll see that this particular table is now gone and let's do a show tables and it's taking a while to go through it. Use HR, show tables, it's gone. Let's take that syntax again, but this time with the updated password. We could have used an alter table 
to update the password. But again, remember, DDL statements are not permitted on federated tables. Let's recreate it. Now that it's recreated, let's attempt to select star from it, and you'll see that we would have regained access to the table. So now we can perform our DML statements as we once were able to. But just keep in mind that federated tables are based on that connection information, and if it changes, you're subject to problems such as inability to access the table, and that could be detrimental. So again, federated tables provide a neat way for you to link to remote tables that are hosted by another MySQL server. You can link n number of servers, n meaning any number of servers that you have in your environment, to any number of tables. You may also link federated tables to other federated tables, just as long as you avoid daisy chaining into a loop. You should have no problem. So for example, in our case, our local system has a table which links to a remote system which could have a federated link to somewhere else. There generally isn't much use for such configurations but it is quite possible. So again, federated tables are very neat and provides a quick way to link to information without having to replicate it at all. And it relies upon fast network connectivity to transport the data set across the interconnects.